Hello and welcome to video lesson 15, the stress tensor and plane stress and plane strain elements. Our learning objectives are to define the stress tensor in two dimensions and three dimensions, to define plane stress and plane strain, and to summarize the constitutive laws for the 3D case as well as for plane stress and plane strain. Now for these uh, particular um, um, notes you should read beer and johnson section 1.4 and uh, chapter 7 as well you may need some references in there as well um so let's just talk about the general problem briefly in solid mechanics uh in general we're going to have some kind of part some kind of mechanical element some kind of structural component that's uh subjected to some kind of arbitrary general loading and um, there are stresses, internal stresses, internal forces that are transmitted throughout the solid body. And uh, we'd like to consider uh, what's happening to a cube of material around P. And we're going to study the full stress tensor by considering what's happening to each face of the cube. And I'm going to consider the Z face. Um, and the Z face is the one where Z is perpendicular to the face and X and Y would lie in the plane of the Z face. Um, now as a result of the externally applied loadings, uh, there's going to be some force that's applied to the top of the cube or to the Z face or the X face or the Y face. So each face of the cube is going to have some kind of um, of traction, and I'm going to call this F sub Z. And uh, the components thereof would be F Z Z, F Z X, and F Z Y. And when I'm talking about subscripts, it's important to note that the first subscript is always for the face, and the second subscript is always for the direction. So we've got three traction components um, and they're F1, F2, or sorry, FZX, uh, uh, FZY, and FZZ. Now let's say I wanted to define uh, three different stresses uh, because uh, I've got a differential element, uh, delta AZ, and this would be the resultant of everything that's acting on the area that we've got delta az so sigma zz is the normal stress on the z face and that's equal to the limit as delta a sub z goes to zero of fzz over delta a sub z and then tau zx would be the shearing stress that results uh, from the x direction component of uh, capital F sub z. So that would be the limit as delta a sub z goes to zero of f zx over delta a sub z. Then tau zy would be the shear stress on the z face in the y direction this component of force divided by the area over which it acts, delta AZ. So tau ZY is equal to the limit as uh, delta AZ goes to zero of FZY over delta AZ. Okay, I could do that for each face of the cube. And if I did that for all six faces, I'd end up with something that looks like this. And then I'd have uh, something on the other side of the cube that's equal and opposite to what's here. So this is really only half of the stress tensor, but everything on the other side is equal and opposite. So if I was to take a look at the X face, I would have sigma XX, uh, tau uh, xy and tau xz. So on the x face, the first subscript for all of the stress components would be x because it's on the x face. And then x, x would be the normal. And then xy and xz would be the 
shear stresses. Similarly, on the Y face, sigma YY is going to act normal to the face, and then tau YX is going to be on the Y face in the X direction, tau YZ is going to be in the Y face in the Z direction. And then for the Z face, as I've talked about already, I would have sigma ZZ as the normal, fa uh, normal stress, and then tau ZX and tau ZY as the other stress components. Now it is important to note that uh, this cube has to be in equilibrium because the whole structure is in equilibrium. And uh, that means that uh, when I've got uh, corresponding shear stresses or complementary shear stresses, X, Y, and Y, X, they're going to create a couple moment that's going to cause a rotation. Like uh, you can see this right here. This is going to uh, spin um, the element this way, but this one is going to spin the other. This one's going to spin this way, but this one's going to spin the other. And the complementary shear stresses are the only things uh, that would be um, causing a moment about the same axis. For instance, uh, tau ZX and tau XZ are the only things that create any moment about the Y axis. Uh, and similarly for, similarly for uh, the X and the Z axis. So uh, if I was to consider the resultants on the cube and I was wanting to keep the cube in moment equilibrium, which uh, is a necessary uh, condition for equilibrium of the cube, that would require tau ZX to be equal to tau XZ. So I end up with relationships that say tau XY equals tau YX, tau YZ equals tau ZY, and tau XZ equals tau ZX. So the complementary shear stresses are always equal in magnitude. And for a stress tensor like this, this is always the positive sign convention for how we would draw positive stresses on the 3D element. So in general, elasticity in three dimensions can be very complicated because there are six stress components, six strain components, and three displacement components for each point in the solid body, which means we end up with a 15 by 15 system of uh, partial differential equations. And that's, uh, that's another topic for another class that would be a follow-on class. But uh, if we can, we want to reduce the number of variables in the problem. So if we can reduce the problem down to a 2D problem, it's typically a lot easier to solve and a lot easier to understand and a lot easier to deal with. And there's a lot of problems that uh, we can solve that are meaningful that are 2D problems. And if they are 2D problems, they're going to fall into either a category of problems called plain stress problems or a category of problems called plain strain problems. Uh, so just to introduce you to these, um, Uh, we would have a two-dimensional element that would have perhaps a unitary thickness or some, some smaller thickness. But all of the stresses would happen in the same um, plane. So there's a plane where X and Y lie in, uh, that, that X and Y lie in. Uh, the Z axis here would be into or out of the page. And all of the stresses are going to be in this um, X, Y plane. And if I've got positive stresses, positive stresses for X and Y are always tensile. And then for the shear stresses, positive shear stresses are always going to point at the upper right-hand corner and the lower left-hand corner. And because complementary shear stresses are equal, I would have tau X, Y equals tau Y, X. And that would be true up here and down here as well. So so this one and this one have to be equal because of Newton's third law, as does that and that, as does the sigma x stresses and the sigma y stresses. So what kinds of problems would have this kind of behavior? Well, uh, first of all, the behavior of pressure vessels that are thin-walled, 
would have that kind of behavior. Stadium roots would have that uh, kind of behavior if uh, you have, uh, for instance, a canvas kind of covering over a structural frame to serve as the roof for, a, for an athletic stadium. Uh, an aircraft fuselage would often be able to be modeled with this kind of an element. Uh, that kind of problem for plane stress would be a very common situation uh, in which you would have um, stress elements of this type. There's another important uh, family of approximations, and uh, this is good for when all of the deformations in the same plane, and that's what we mean by plane strain. Um, in the case of uh, plane stress, there was no stress on the uh, on the Z face, but here we're talking about situations where we'd have very long elements under homogeneous loads, uh, and that would be things like dams or strip footings or long brackets, um, anything where one dimension is significantly longer than the others, and all of the deformation would happen in the same plane. So if that's the case, then uh, I would have a confining or a restraining pressure uh, that, or a stress that would happen on the Z face. And it's just enough uh, to keep the element from uh, having any out of plane deformations. So sigma ZZ here would always be equal to nu times sigma XX plus sigma YY. Um, <clears throat> And then uh, we would have the same stress components that we would have for the plain stress case. Um, the only difference here is that uh, epsilon ZZ is equal to zero, but uh, the stress on the Z face therefore can't be but on the plane strain problem, we've got a situation where uh, sigma ZZ equals zero and uh, epsilon ZZ is equal to negative nu times epsilon XX plus epsilon YY. So for strains there. Uh, and we've talked about those earlier in the lessons on normal and shear strain. Okay. So that's the main difference is that in plain stress, sigma ZZ is zero and um, we would calculate an epsilon um, ZZ. In plain strain, epsilon ZZ is zero and the sigma ZZ is whatever is required to confine the, um, to restrain the member such that there is no out of plane deformation. So we, uh, so we have a lot of problems that we can solve in 2D and it can be really, really helpful to solve a lot of problems in 2D. Uh, and we have those two classes of problems where we have the 2D approximations for, um, the problem. So certain things are uh, assumed to be zero and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, it's always going to happen that stress and strain is in general related through Hooke's Law and in the most general form, and this is always true regardless of um, what kind of approximation we have, whether it's a plane stress approximation or a plane strain approximation, we could plug in whatever is zero and these equations would simplify to whatever we would uh, would have um, for that uh, be the case, whether it was plane stress, plane strain problem, you name it. Uh, so uh, in general, we have six equations for Hooke's Law once we're in 3D. Because we have six stresses that we are trying to relate to six strains or vice versa, we could invert these equations and uh, solve for the stresses in terms of strains and uh, uh, go, uh, go the other way as well. Um, but uh, here we are going to have the stresses given to us and we want the strain tensor. 
Um, this, of course, is a problem in matrix inversion. If I wanted to go the other way to solve this system for stresses, if I was given strains. Um, uh, but we would have uh, epsilon x equal to 1 over e times sigma xx minus nu times sigma yy plus sigma zz. Uh, epsilon y would be 1 over e times sigma yy minus nu times sigma xx plus sigma zz. And epsilon z equals 1 over e times sigma zz minus nu times sigma xx plus sigma yy. And then we've uh, had uh, Hooke's law for shear, uh, which is good for each direction independently. And those six together form the set of equations that we have as Hooke's law. And if I was to put them in matrix form, I could do it like this. Um, and there's some use made of the equation that G is equal to E over two times one plus nu. Uh, but it would be this set of equations right here for Hooke's law in 3D. Well, there are some important uh, simplifications for uh, plane stress and plane strain. In plane stress, I would have uh, sigma zz, tau yz, and tau xz all equal to zero. And there is no out of plane uh, shear strain either. So tau xz equals tau, uh, sorry, gamma xz equals gamma yz equals zero. So those things are all equal to zero. I would have tau xy equal to g gamma z, uh, sorry, tau xy equals g gamma xy. And then these three equations that we've talked about here all carry forward. And uh, if I just knew that epsilon zz was equal to one over e times sigma zz minus nu sigma xx plus sigma yy, I could take that and these four and be complete on everything that is non-zero. So if I was to write these equations in a matrix form, uh, I would have uh, epsilon xx, epsilon yy, and gamma xy. On this side, um, I would have uh, sigma xx, sigma yy, and tau xy on this side as well. Um, and then uh, I would uh, have a matrix that has uh, 1 over E, negative nu over E, 0, negative nu over E, 1 over E, 0, and 0, 0, 1 over G uh, to relate the two. So I have those four equations in this red cloud that would be what I would need to get from one set of quantities to the other. So if I knew the stresses, sigma xx, sigma yy, and tau xy, I would feed them in right here. I'd get um, the corresponding strains here. Uh, and if I knew, um, uh, and I would know that sigma zz is zero, So I would have epsilon zz equals one over e times negative nu times sigma xx plus sigma yy. All right, so that's uh, the set of equations I would want to use for plane stress. Uh, for plane strain, uh, I would have certain other definitions that would uh, that would hold. So gamma xz equals gamma yz equals gamma, uh, equals epsilon zz equals zero. That means there's no out of plane deformation. Uh, that also requires that tau yz equals tau zx equals zero. Uh, I would have uh, the confining pressure of sigma zz equal to nu times uh, sigma xx plus sigma yy. And then tau xy equals g gamma xy. And then I would have a matrix set of equations here that would relate the sigmas, uh, the stresses to the strains. So in general, what I would want to do is I'd want to know the stress tensor at some point. I would be able to use this uh, set of equations to recover all of the strains. 
And then uh, the confining strain, the, re the restrained, uh, uh, the, the uh, stress resulting from the restraint that has to be applied to keep C uh, epsilon ZZ equal to zero is equal to nu times sigma XX plus sigma YY. And uh, I, so to wrap up, we've talked a lot about um, a lot of things. I don't want you to worry too much about the definitions here. However, I did want you to see these if you ever needed to look something up. Uh, you might see uh, the use of some of these equations perhaps on a mechanics materials section on the FE exam. Uh, so it is important to talk briefly about these equations. However, I do not anticipate you using these a lot in computations for problems that you're going to be solving in this course uh, this semester. So uh, just make sure you understand the positive sign conventions and the uh, simplifications that we're likely to use whenever we draw the stress tensors, and you'll be fine for everything incoming. That's all for video lesson 15.